Hello and welcome to the annual lecture by the Good Governance Institute. I'm Anna Barnes and I'll be guiding today's session. As of last week, I started work on CQC compliance, specifically the well-led standard at University Hospital of Sussex. But previous to this, I was the Associate Director for the Integrated Programme at South West London and St George's Mental Health Trust, which was the redevelopment of the Springfield site. So, but with relevance to today, I serve as chair of the CV project in St Leonard's. The charity provides support services for marginalised individuals dealing with addiction, mental health issues, uh, ex and risk, ex and at risk offenders and rough sleepers, helping them achieve personal growth and fulfilment. Uh, today's annual lecture is part of the GDI's Festival of Governance, the ninth year of the festival, and this year the theme is Good Governance because scarcity is real. So my, with my role in the voluntary sector, of course, we do live and breathe scarcity. We have to match fund some services ourselves because the local authority can no longer afford to pay us what they cost to run. We work with people who are at the right at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of need to the extent that at any given time, 50 people use our services. Using our services have no shelter, food or means of support. However, today, I think we'll be interpreting scarcity in its broadest sense mm. and exploring the opportunities it brings, as well as its limitations, fitting within the context of the cost of living crisis, but also in terms of those of us yearning to live a simpler and more sustainable life with regard to our impact on the planet. So it's opportunities as, as well as the risks. <clears throat> Before we dive into this year's annual lecture by Jane Davidson, who's sitting with us here, I'm delighted to have Sir Michael Marmot to present Jane with the Good Governance Award. Sir Michael won the award in 2021 in recognition of his extensive and dedicated work on health inequalities and evidence-based decision-making. He is the director of the UCL Institute of Health Equity and is best known for his influential report on health inequalities in England titled Fair Society, Healthy Lives or The Marmot Review. It, it's a personal privilege for me to introduce Sir Michael, as I previously worked at NHS Right Care, a population uh, health programme at NHS England. And I do remember your work on like, showing the life expectancy figures uh, were going down the first time in a generation. Um, and, and there was demonstration of the link between austerity and life expectancy decreasing. Um, which was uh, like a mind blowing discovery. Uh, and so I felt that was a very brave thing to come out to talk about. So bravery, but also an absolute command of the data at your disposal. So over to you, Sir Michael. It was a privilege to be the recipient of the Good Governance Award and an extra privilege to, as it were, pass it on. <laughs> uh, let me say just a few words. I've been thinking about governance uh, let me start with one way of thinking about bad governance. How about five prime ministers in six years, seven chancellors of the Exchequer, seven secretaries of state for health. I've lost count of how many housing ministers. We're in absolute chaos. One description of bad governance has to be the kind of chaos we're now in. How can you possibly develop a programme for government when you've had seven chancellors of the Exchequer in less than seven years? Uh, absolute chaos. Now that's particular to Britain at the moment. I have a slightly broader approach to what constitutes good and bad governance. I see everything through the lens of health and health equity. Because of the evidence on social determinants of health, we can say that if health is improving, society is improving. If health has failed to improve, society has failed to improve. If health inequalities are getting bigger, inequalities in society are getting bigger. If health for the poorest people is getting worse, circumstances of living for the poorest people is getting worse. And that's what's happened in Britain since 2010. Life expectancy more or less stopped improving. Inequalities in health got bigger. 
and health for the poorest people got worse. I'd like to say that Wales was better than that, but it wasn't. Wales was like England, only more so. And maybe that's not a fair comparison. Maybe we should be comparing Wales with the northeast or northwest of England, um, because that's more what it looks like in terms of their health statistics. But I want to come back to Wales in a moment. So why has this happened? Well, given what I said about the social determinants of health, I was commenting on a report yesterday that rickets has gone up, scurvy has gone up. Uh, rickets, mm -hmm. scurvy. I could be reading Dickens' Hard Times. Rickets and scurvy. It's already out of date. Last, I think it was November, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation published a report on destitution in Britain. Destitution. In 2022, with the figures, it was defined as doing without two or more of housing, heat, light, food, appropriate clothing for the conditions, and toiletries, soap and toothpaste, sanitary products. And 3.8 million people in Britain in 2022, including 1 million children, were in a state of destitution. The Prime Minister likes to claim that absolute poverty has gone down. He should be a bit careful in making that claim. That 1 million children represents a 2.9-fold increase between 2017 and 2022. So we're seeing diseases of malnutrition. We're seeing people die because of poor quality housing. We have excess winter mortality because of cold homes. Cold homes damage children's lungs. They damage their mental health. This is Britain in 2024. It's a pretty grim picture. But there are some bright spots on the horizon, and one of them is in Wales. The Wales, or do I say the Welsh Future Generations Act, really, to my mind, represents the kind of good governance that I'd like to see. It's a country's government thinking about the future, not the date of the next election, not can we give away some goodies before the next election, but the Future Generations Act. Wow. And in what I've just been mentioning about destitution in Britain, I didn't mention the climate crisis. And what we know in Britain, as in many other European countries, if you ask people, as the Gallup organisation has done, do you think your children will have a worse life than you, a better life than you, or about the same. One third, only one third of people think their children will have a better life than them. And I'm guessing that they weren't taking the climate crisis into account when they answered that question. If they took the climate crisis into account, it would be even worse. So the fact that the Wales Future Generations Act is thinking about our children, our future generations, about the climate, about sustainability, about inequality and equity. How can we create better conditions for the whole of society? When I was asked to introduce you, and I thought, wow, what an opportunity. <laughs> I asked you when we came in today, were you really the architect <laughs> of the Wales Future Generation Act? It's just a brilliant piece of, not just legislation, but, but planning for the future of creating a better society for now and for future generations. It's an absolute privilege to award you this award, to hand you this award, because of what you've done in Wales and that Wales is potentially a shining light to other countries at how to plan for the future, taking sustainability 
and inequity into account at the same time and thinking about the whole of society, not one government department, but the whole of government, all the relevant departments. It's an absolute privilege to be sitting here with you. Can I give you an award? <laughs> Oh, look Jane, at that. can I hand you this? <laughs> Isn't that absolutely wonderful? And I should have mentioned that you were responsible for the Wales coastal <laughs> So, but... <laughs> so this is a scene from St. Leonard's, um, donated by the artist Tim Nathan. Um, he really wishes you well and um, thank you very much for all you do. And it's a reminder that uh, no matter how bad things get, we can always turn to nature um, to bring us back to ourselves. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, thank, thank you to um, the Good Governance Institute um, for the work you do, actually, because Michael, as you were saying, uh, we, we, live in a, we live in a very odd time where uh, the whole notion about how you take good decisions is under threat. And yet when you and I worked together uh, when I was in Welsh Government back in the early 2000s, we were really focused on evidence-based outcomes. And evidence-based outcomes meant you had to think about not just the decision that you took, but how you took the decision, how people were going to get to uh, the outcome from uh, that decision and what that, what that was going to mean in terms of improving people's lives. And I think it would be unfair to my parents, two doctor parents, <laughs> so I've grown up with do no harm, particularly my father, who is a consultant in public health medicine. Um, it was so important, this public health message about the big changes that we've seen in our lives have been about legislation that has cleaned water, that has created sewers. The big issues straight after the war, for example, when we saw the, 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 the government actually embrace issues about giving people free education, about giving them housing, about giving them the means to live, the very things which appear to be lacking at the moment. And I have actually, I think, spent the most of my life, my working life, just trying to work out how you can create good decisions. So I'm really a policy nerd. It's extraordinary <laughs> to be offered a war an award for being a policy wonk. <laughs> but essentially, that's what I am. And a walker <laughs> and a swimmer. Yeah. So that picture uh, of the sea um, is, 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 is delightful. But I, I just want to say that in the context of the lecture that um, uh, you're all about to hear, um, it's actually about taking an opportunity because Wales had a real opportunity back in 1999 when devolution first happened uh, to create a new way of working. And we initially found that that was really tricky. So we had to make sure that if we really wanted to enshrine a way of working that looked upstream, that was about making people healthier, about um, enhancing biodiversity and bringing more nature back to Wales, about creating livable communities, about looking at current and future generations, then actually we needed to enshrine it in law. And it was a bee bomb, I think, that uh, it was described as when I left government. And so it was the next administration that had to take it forward. So I'm not the architect of the act. I'm the architect of the framework <laughs> of the act. And it was actually that administration. It was those people. It was the people of Wales created that act between 2011 and 2015. And we're still learning how to use it. So I hope when people listen to this lecture now, um, we're on a learning journey. We're still getting our processes right. 
But I hope you'll be able to see that in the work, for example, that I'm doing in Wales at the moment, trying to see, can we deliver net zero 2035 pathways, i.e. 10 year pathways um, to creating a Wales that with a just transition and that is nature positive. Now it's a big journey and it's a big ambitious <laughs> idea we're trying to do. But I hope that people listening today will actually help us on this journey. And thank you all so much. The work of the Good Governance Institute has never been so important.